Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com. From the St. Louis Public Radio Newsroom, this is The Gateway. It's Tuesday, May 14th. I'm Abby Larico. Six-time Grammy winner David Sanborn has died at the age of 78. He grew up in Kirkwood and built a career playing with giants of many different musical styles. That spirit of discovery for me, and I think that really comes from my early days in St. Louis. St. Louis Public Radio's Jeremy Goodwin spoke with Sanborn in February about the key to his eclectic output. That's coming up on The Gateway. A Chesterfield man charged with intentionally crashing a box truck into a security barrier across from the White House last year has pleaded guilty. The U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C. announced Sai Varshith Kandula accepted a charge of willful injury or depredation of U.S. property for the May 2023 incident. Authorities say Kandula flew from St. Louis to Washington, rented a truck, and immediately went to the White House, something he'd been planning for six months. Court documents show Candula says he wanted to seize power in the attempted security breach and admitted he would have arranged for the killing of the president, quote, if necessary to achieve his objective. He will be sentenced in August. Some of Washington University's newest graduates used their commencement ceremony to show their support for Palestinians during the ongoing war in Gaza. As St. Louis Public Radio's Sarah Fenton reports, Monday's event mostly occurred without any disruptions after two recent campus protests that ended in arrests. Several students wore scarves, flag pins, and other tokens of their support for Palestinians during the event at WashU's Francis Olympic Field. University Chancellor Andrew Martin received scattered boos during parts of a speech that emphasized taking personal responsibility for one's beliefs and actions. Actress Jennifer Coolidge and other speakers sometimes competed with the chance of a few dozen protesters outside the ceremony. Graduating senior Natalie Swinehart says she's glad the protests weren't too disruptive. I'm happy that people stood for what they wanted to stand for, um, and I think they did it in a very respectful way. Swinehart says many of this year's seniors graduated from high school during the height of the coronavirus pandemic, and this was the first big graduation ceremony they were able to attend. I'm Sarah Fenton, St. Louis Public Radio. As Sarah mentioned, dozens of protesters stood outside Washington University's graduation ceremony, calling on the university to stop investing in Boeing, which supplies the Israeli military with weapons. Many demonstrators also expressed solidarity with Palestinians in Gaza. Protester Sarah Nixon says they're demanding justice for those arrested in April during two pro-Palestinian demonstrations on campus, where police arrested more than 100 people. We demand that they drop the disciplinary cases against students, staff, faculty who were arrested, banned from campus, brutalized, including a Palestinian professor who's, who had nine ribs broken. WashU officials say they welcome peaceful protests, but last month's demonstrations were disruptive. Drought conditions in Missouri have improved after all the rain from the last few weeks. St. Louis Public Radio's Kate Grumke reports on what officials shared as they met to discuss the drought. Missouri has been under an official drought alert since the end of May last year. But on Monday, state officials said an especially wet April is starting to fix the problem. Last month, most of Missouri saw normal or better stream flow, says Paul Ridland from the U.S. Geological Survey. We're on the right side of this, uh, moving the right direction in April. And then uh, we're going to see more of this, of course, in May. May is typically the wettest month of the year in Missouri. Still, Ridland said this doesn't mean the drought is over. Last month, Missouri Governor Mike Parson extended the alert through September 1st. I'm Kate Grumke. St. Louis Public Radio. A new report released Monday by the Office of Missouri Auditor Scott Fitzpatrick says state government agencies need to take cybersecurity threats more seriously. He recommends Missouri improve state employee training in order to protect resources like government data, systems, and monetary funds. The auditor's report covered 34 government agencies employing roughly 52,000 workers. The report found that many state agencies don't consistently train their employees on cybersecurity. It also says that in some Missouri government agencies, 20 percent of employees didn't complete any of the cybersecurity training they were required to do during the first half of 2023. 
St. Louis University's student governing body unanimously passed a resolution to push the university to reconcile its history of slavery and to immediately repair the harm. As St. Louis Public Radio's Andrea Henderson reports, a coalition of descendants says they deserve reparations from the university. SLU Student Government Association wants the university to work harder at repaying the descendants of those enslaved by SLU Jesuits during the 1800s. The resolution passed on April 24th calls for SLU to work with descendants on strategic reparative plans. It also calls for the administration to connect with other universities that have reconciled their connection to slavery. Robin Prouty is the founder of the Descendants of the St. Louis University enslaved. The harm was multidimensional and it was intergenerational. So the repair should be multidimensional and intergenerational. Prouty says the university needs to put in more effort and hopes the student's resolution will push SLU to act now. I'm Andrea Henderson, St. Louis Public Radio. Kirkwood-raised musician David Sanborn died on Sunday after an extended battle with prostate cancer. He won six Grammy Awards and sold millions of albums across a more than 50-year career. Known for his warm sound on alto saxophone, Sanborn won acclaim as a solo artist and as a collaborator with a long list of stars in the worlds of jazz, rock, and pop. Earlier this year, Jazz St. Louis honored Sanborn with its first Lifetime Achievement Award. Before that ceremony, St. Louis Public Radio's Jeremy Goodwin spoke with Sanborn about his early years in and around St. Louis, which shaped his broad musical outlook. David Sanborn is best known for blending jazz, pop, and light R&B into an accessible hybrid that has sold millions of albums. You can get a taste of it on Funky Banana. That's a song from his 1975 solo debut, appropriately called Taking Off. Before Sanborn truly took off, he got his taste for live music in a St. Louis social scene that doesn't exist anymore. They, they used to call them teen towns. There were these, uh, I guess, recreational centers, uh, community centers in, in various places. Sunset Hills was one I remember. They, the bands would set up outside around a swimming pool, and all these great regional bands came through, people like uh, uh, Little Milton and Albert King. And my friend and I, we, we used to hang out, you know, like at the front of the bandstand, just like completely hypnotized by this music. It was at one of those teen towns when Sanborn was 14 that he asked if he could sit in with Little Milton, and it changed his life. So they allowed me to get up stage and play these, you know, with the horn section doing stuff like da-da, da-da, playing these horn parts. Not very complicated, but just to be in that situation and be with these musicians and just to feel the power of the music like that was, uh, it was astonishing to me. From that moment on, I just, it wasn't that I planned on being a musician, it's just that I, there was nothing, nothing else that I really wanted to do. It was like, you know, well, I'm doing this. <laughs> At 22, he joined the Paul Butterfield Blues Band and played Woodstock with them. Then he joined Stevie Wonder's band. It was just the beginning of his collaborations with musicians playing just about any style of music. His sax breaks are crucial to David Bowie's hit Young Americans. Sanborn says this openness to different styles is rooted in his days in St. Louis. When he was playing with some of the boundary-pushing musicians who would later go on to start groups like the Art Ensemble of Chicago and St. Louis's Black Artist Group. That spirit of discovery for me, and I think that really comes from my early days in St. Louis. The guys that I played with, Lester Bowie, Hemphill, Oliver Lake, Philip Wilson, they didn't discriminate in terms of genre. If it was good, it was good. So Lester would do a you know gig with a circus, and then he'd do an R and B gig with the Temptations, or, and then he'd do a jazz gig, and then he'd do a free gig. So it was the idea that you didn't draw boundaries, and I think that attitude, really, more than anything else, 
that I brought from St. Louis really shaped me. It was like, it's all good. You know, just try this. That was musician David Sanborn speaking with St. Louis Public Radio's Jeremy Goodwin back in February. Sanborn died Sunday at the age of 78. Our Brian Moline and David Cazares edited that piece. The Gateway is a production of St. Louis Public Radio, a listener-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I'm Abby Larico, and from the St. Louis Public Radio newsroom, this has been The Gateway. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to conservation and careful management of the state's forests to make them more resilient and better habitats for wildlife. Choosewood.com.